Well, thank you all for being here, and thanks uh, to the Los Alamos Historical Society for, uh, for inviting me to come up and, uh, and talk. This is a great honor for me to be here, um, and it's an honor for a couple reasons. One is, as you probably all know, um, Dr. Oppenheimer was in this room. Um, he was in Fuller, Hall, uh, Fuller Lodge here. And uh, before I go on, I, has, I suspect that some of you might have met um, Dr. Oppenheimer. I was wondering, could we see a show of hands of who, who uh, met Abby? Okay. So it's an honor for me to, to, to be in your presence as well. Um, how many of you danced with it? How many of you danced with Abby? We have two. <laughs> he was a good dancer? Yes. <laughs> um, the other reason that it's a great honor for me to be here is um, I started my career as an atomic historian in this building. Um, in January of 1991, um, I came here for, as a master's student from UNM, and I uh, researched in the archives upstairs trying to figure out a topic for my thesis. And um, during that day, that afternoon of research, I thought, it's just like a light bulb went off over my head, that I would interview people who grew up in Los Alamos from 1943 to the 1960s. And that became my master's thesis, and eventually then turned into the book Inventing Los Alamos. Now, after I did the research here, I went off of the hill into Santa Fe, and Ellen Reed was having her annual De Sosa didn't discover New Mexico party uh, around January 11th, is that when it is? Um, and so I, I went to that party in 1991, and I said to Ellen, boy, I just got this great idea for a research project, interviewing people who grew up in Los Alamos. And she said, well, you, I can be your first interviewee. And so I interviewed her, and eventually I interviewed a lot of other people. But this is the building that really kind of launched my career as an atomic historian. So it's a, uh, it doesn't get much better than this for an atomic historian to, to lecture here in historic Fuller Hall um, to people who uh, work in Los Alamos and some people who, who met Oppenheimer and even danced with Oppenheimer. <laughs> Let me give you a little bit of history about myself. Um, Historians often are interested in the topics that we're interested in for autobiographical reasons, and I'm no exception. My father was a career Air Force officer, and uh, he uh, worked for what was called DASA back in the 60s, Defense Atomic Support Agency. And um, at one point, he was a deputy commander of Manzano Base, where um, some of our stockpile was warehoused in the 1960s. Um, and so growing up, um, we had, um, photographs of atomic shots on our family room wall. Now, when I usually say that to audiences, people scratch their head, but I suspect tonight that maybe some of you have also had shots of atomic, or photographs of atomic shots on your family room wall. Um, and I remember in the late 1950s when we were stationed on Sandia Base in Albuquerque, uh, and I think it was probably around Veterans Day, so it was, in, it was kind of chilly and it was in November, um, my father and my mom put myself and my two brothers in our woody station wagon and went to the parade ground. And that's a huge parade ground there. And back then, you know, there was a, a flagpole and where most military bases have howitzers, um, for that day, Sandia Base had replicas of Fat Man and Little Boy. And I was about seven at the time. And for myself and my brothers, it looked suspiciously like playground equipment. So we jumped on these replicas. <laughs> and started clamoring over them, and my father quickly grabbed us off and threw us back in the station wagon and went home. But I, I've, I've been clamoring over atomic weapons in a way since then. Um, there's a proliferation of Oppenheimer books. Um, some have won Pulitzer Prize lately, American Prometheus by Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin. Um, and it seems like every year at least one or two more come out. Um, uh, mine is a little bit different, um, and that's one of the, one of the topics I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to write this, though, was when I teach U.S. history and 20th century history at New Mexico State University, I oftentimes ask the 19, 18, 19, 20-year-olds that I teach if they 
um, know somebody named Oppenheimer. And sometimes they reply, well, does that person have anything to do with the Oppenheimer Fund? <laughs> so one of the reasons I wrote this book was for a general audience and even more specific for college classrooms because I think this is one of the most important um, historic figures of the 20th century uh, and younger generations don't know a whole lot about him. So I wrote this book in particular for those college classrooms that will assign some supplementary reading. So it's about 200 pages long. It's not a definitive biography of Oppenheimer. Um, it's uh, it's, it's, it's uh, hopefully uh, readable um, and will introduce to a new generation um, this very important person. Um, one of my main differences uh, with other books is I focus on how the West influenced Robert Oppenheimer and then conversely how he impacted the West. And I'll get into this in a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, and then the last part of the talk tonight will be focusing on uh, Oppenheimer and, his, uh, and the revocation of his top security status. Um, partly that's why it's called Chasing Oppie. Uh, as a historian, I chased Oppie, chased him through archives. I, uh, I chased him uh, through places that he lived at, um, right up the street here, but also a hotel in Washington, D.C. It was a lot of fun chasing him. Um, probably a little bit like the FBI agents who were chasing him too, but for different motives. Um, so, so this is a, a part of the story of Oppenheimer that really is more like a Greek tragedy. This is somebody who, was, um, who helped end World War II, who helped create a new age, who was celebrated uh, around the, across the country as well as, as with our allies and around the world. He was a public intellectual, um, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. And then within 10 years of, uh, of the end of World War II, um, he fell from grace. It's almost like, almost like the, the Greek myth of Daedalus. This young boy, a who, who, uh, young man who, who made wings out of, I think, beeswax and, uh, and flew and flew so close to the sun that it melted the, the beeswax and his wings fell apart and he fell to earth. And I think that's, that's somewhat appropriate for, for Oppenheimer. Um, Oppenheimer first encountered the West. Um, right after he graduated from the Ethical Culture School in February of 1920, uh, 1921. At the age of 17, he and his family went to Germany, uh, uh, but he planned on entering Harvard uh, right after that, that fall. Uh, he kept active uh, at the Ethical Cultural School, uh, conducting a science project uh, throughout the spring, and then he traveled to Europe, and with his brother, they hiked through some mountains in southern Germany. And when he, when he was there, he contracted a severe case of, of dysentery. He was already somewhat frail, and the sickness forced him to postpone his entrance into Harvard as he recovered, first in Europe and then back in the United States. Along with dysentery, he was also struck with colitis. The extended convalescence to his parents' apartment in New York, and then with several trips, not only allowed him to recover, but also experienced new parts of the country. In the spring of 1922, Oppenheimer traveled to the south, by that summer, Robert had recovered enough to head west. To cap off a year of recuperation with a vigorous trip, trip west, Robert's parents asked the genial Herbert Smith, who was, was his literature teacher at the Ethical Culture School, to accompany their son in his travels. Over the decades, health seekers in the United States had ventured west to take the cure. So I'm gonna have to run back and forth here. To take the cure. Um, the journey not only restored health to many of the travelers, it also introduced them to a world different from the rest of the country. For example, Theodore Roosevelt, who was president when Robert was born, spent several years in the Badlands of Dakotas as a young man. His time in the saddle on a ranch, uh, Roosevelt's time, uh, changed him from a sickly person to the historic persona full of vigor and charisma that we know. The Southwest offered dramatic landscapes with high mountains and distant vistas, Native Americans and Hispanics with unique cultures and a worldview distinctly different from anything that even the young but travel savvy Robert had experienced in Europe. Going West also offered an escape from the ills not only of one's body, but of industrial America. At about the same time that Robert and Herbert 
disembarked from the train in New Mexico, other people from the East, intellectuals, writers, artists, sought refuge from the disappointments of the failed peace after World War I and from the rampant consumerism and the hustling uh, industrialism of the Roaring Twenties. Like others, Robert and Herbert found refuge in the mountains and villages of New Mexico. For weeks, Robert and Herbert hiked and rode horses over the steep mountains, camped in the great outdoors, and bunked at guest ranches. Their headquarters was Los Pinos, a guest ranch at Cowles, high in the San Rio de Cristo Mountains, east of Santa Fe and above Pecos. Los Pinos was run by Catherine Chavez Page and her new husband, Winthrop. Catherine came from an established Hispanic family headed by Don Amado Chavez, and they accepted Oppenheimer and Smith into the circle of family and friends. Smith later commented that because of Robert's acceptance by the patriarch Don Amado and the aristocratic Chavez clan, quote, for the first time in his life, Robert found himself loved, admired, sought after, end quote. For an insecure and sheltered young man, this acceptance did as much as a crisp desert air to cure him of his ailments. Another family that embraced Robert in New Mexico was the Fergusons. Francis Ferguson had attended the Ethical Cultural School in New York with Robert. He and Herbert visited them in Albuquerque when they met Francis's brother Harvard, Harvey and sister Erna. Both Harvey and Erna would distinguish themselves as Southwestern writers in the coming years. In one of Harvey's later novels, Grant of Kingdom, he wrote of northern New Mexico in a way that helps explain the extraction of the landscape. Quote, to the west, the country tumbled steeply to purple depths where the Rio Grande crawled through lava gorges, then rose again to a pale blue horizon of distant ranges." End quote. This could have described the view from the mountaintops that Robert and Herbert witnessed that summer. His trip to the southwest introduced Robert to a place that would dramatically alter his future. Robert, Herbert, and their companions uh, traveled over a wide area of the southwest during their month in the region. They climbed the high San Rio Cristo Mountains and Jemez Mountains, and they drove northwest to Telluride and Uray, Colorado. They rode horses through landscapes where American Indian ruins from the, 19th, from the 1300s hid among the stunted pino pines and uh, towering ponderosa pine trees. They met Hispanic sheep herders uh, tending to their flocks, and they were welcomed by the Chavez family, who had lived in the land of enchantment for several, uh, several hundred years. Riding into the deeply creviced plateaus and along high mountain sides, they interacted with both the landscape and the people of New Mexico. 21 years later, Robert would pick this part of the country as a place to create an atomic bomb. Robert would return to the high mountains of New Mexico time and time again over the next two decades to recover from his hectic life. Um, although it took him several years before he returned uh, uh, to it while he was at Harvard. In the meantime, he longed for the West, as evidenced in letters that he wrote to Herbert Smith, who had planned to spend the summer in New Mexico in 1923. Robert complained, quote, quote, Of course I am insanely jealous. I see you riding down the mountains to the desert at that hour when thunderstorms and sunsets carapace in the sky. And I see you in the Pecos, spending the moonlight on Grass Mountain. I see you vending the marvels of the upper lock, of the upper amphitheater of Uray, of the waterfall at Telluride, the punch bowl at San Isidro, even the prairies around Antonito to Philistine eyes." End quote. Robert sped through Harvard in three years, and in 1925 uh, was accepted to do graduate work at Cambridge. With his entrance to Cambridge finalized, Robert went to the mountains of, mountains of New Mexico before leaving for England and the arduous work of pursuing a PhD in physics. This was his first time back since he had roamed the forested high desert plateaus with Herbert Smith in 1922. Although he had not visited for three years, he had kept in touch with the friends he had made around Cowles. One time, he sent at considerable expense a cake made in New York City for the 70th birthday celebration of Amado Chavez, the patriarch of the family. Um, on the cake was the family crest of the Chavez family. For the visit in 1925, Robert had his parents and his brother Frank with him. Frank stayed with him at the ranch in Cowles, and their parents resided in the more luxurious Bishop's Lodge near Santa Fe, the side trips to the mountaintop retreat. <coughs> For the Oppenheimer family and their friends, they enjoyed a wide range of activities, trips to American Indian dances, 
crowds in at the annual Santa Fe Fiesta, and this is a zobra here, but most of all, riding horses up the high peaks that towered over the cabinet cowls. The author, Paul Horgan, visited the group and described one of their jumps. They hired horses in Santa Fe, which is about 7,000 feet, and, and they planned to ride up over the Sangre de Cristos and down into Cowles. As a crow flies, that's about 10, maybe 15 miles. But the peaks that they ascended to rose well above 10,000 feet. As Horgan recalled, quote, it turned out to be a day-long venture, full of merriment and nonsense as we rode. We hit the divide at the top of the mountain in a tremendous thunderstorm, immense, huge, pounding rain. We sat under our horses for lunch and ate oranges and were drenched. I was looking at Robert, and all of a sudden, I noticed his, hand, his hair was standing straight up, responding to the static, end quote. Surviving the storm, they arrived at Cowles about 7 p.m., fortunate not to have been struck, by the lightning on the mountain. From this idyllic romp in the southwest, Oppenheimer boarded an ocean liner in New York City and headed across the Atlantic to devote himself to physics. Now, we don't have time to go into that, but uh, let me just skip ahead a little bit. Oppenheimer left Germany in 1927 with a PhD in hand. I'm, I'm sorry I skipped that. That sounds so easy, but I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> Oppenheimer, after that, he went and uh, uh, taught and conducted research at Harvard University and at the California Institute of Technology as a National Research Fellow. During his time as a postdoctoral fellow in the late 1920s, he began receiving offers of employment from universities. He received 10 offers from the United States and two from Europe. He eventually chose the University of California, Berkeley, partially because, as he later recalled, it was, quote, a desert. There was no theoretical physics, and I thought it would be nice to try and start something, end quote. However, because Oppenheimer had rushed through Harvard, he lacked a solid grasp of the mathematical computations necessary for complex physics. Consequently, he asked for a leave before he began teaching at Berkeley to do more postdoc work. The university granted his request, but then Robert, who had developed a persistent and nagging cough, and I think he started smoking on some of the horseback rides in New Mexico, uh, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Like millions of tubercular patients before him, Oppenheimer retreated to the healthy air of the desert southwest. He went back to the mountains of northern New Mexico to get cured. While there, Oppenheimer's friend from the Chavez family, Catherine Page, showed him a cabin for rent high in the mountains. Set at the end of an alpine meadow and surrounded by towering evergreen trees, the rough hewn cabin had a spectacular view of the surrounding 12,000 foot peaks and the distant valleys. valleys. The cabin lacked running water and toilets. For roughing it, Robert had found an ideal retreat. And when he heard that he rented it, he exclaimed, hot dog. He translated that into Spanish, and Perro Caliente became the permanent name of his mount mountaintop hideaway. Oppenheimer and his brother Frank, and later their wives and assorted friends and colleagues, spent summers at Perro Caliente, Caliente riding the high country, talking physics, and recovering from their hectic lives at the university. Robert's son, Peter, still owns the cabin. This is a photograph of uh, Oppenheimer and Ernest Lawrence in New Mexico in the 1930s. So Lawrence also came to the mountaintop uh, retreat. When Oppie started at Berkeley, he rode into the university as if he was careening down a mountain on horseback. Oppenheimer's brashness brought physics west of the Mississippi. In a very short time, he established a world-renowned center for theoretical physics in the hills above the San Francisco Bay. In Europe, Oppie had learned the latest experimental results and theories in a rapidly changing field of atomic physics. At Berkeley, he started his own program, and within five years had created one of the best theoretical physics departments in the country. <coughs> the westward tilt of science, energized by Oppie's arrival in California, changed both the academic field of physics and in history itself. By the mid-1930s, the University of California at Berkeley had become a center for the advanced studies in physics. Part of this was, of course, due to Oppie, but also credit must be given to others as well at Berkeley, including Ernest Lawrence and his experimental work with cyclotrons. The partnership between the theoretical and the experimental physicists forged new theories which attracted national attention. Robert Serber, who, had become one of, who would become one of Oppie's graduate assistants, is an example of this. He had planned on going to Princeton after he received his PhD in physics from Wisconsin. But at a summer institute in Michigan, he met Oppenheimer, who made such an enormous impression on Serber that he changed his mind. As Serber later recalled, quote, 
I went to Berkeley in 1934, and when I got there, I discovered that three of the five people who had won national research fellowships were students of Oppenheimer at Berkeley. That was an extraordinary center of theoretical physics. It was the great one that existed in this country, the one that Oppenheimer had created for his students." End quote. Within his first five years in California, Oppie had transformed the physics department of Berkeley, and along with Lawrence and others, had established a national reputation that attracted men and women from around the country. This quick establishment of Berkeley as a national center illustrates Oppenheimer's brilliance in tilting the center of physics west. Victor Weisskopf, who was at Göttingen University at the same time as Oppenheimer, and then played a leading role with the development of atomic weapons, commented about Berkeley in the 1930s, quote, Oppenheimer and his group were completely on par with European physics. Of course, the culmination of this westward tilt of physics in the 1930s and early 40s occurred right here in, in Los Alamos. In November of 1942, with the world at war and the Army Corps of Engineers looking for a site for the Central Laboratory for the Manhattan Project, Oppie led the search committee, including General Leslie Groves here. Although Groves might have said more like, this is the place, then this is the place, um, he acceded to Oppie, who wanted to marry his two loves, physics, and New Mexico. After World War II, the West of the United States was transformed by the atomic age, transformed from a frontier region, not as developed as the rest of the country, into a section of the country at the forefront of advanced technology, from the plutonium processing plants at Hanford, Washington, to scientific laboratories in California and New Mexico, from atomic facilities in Texas, Idaho, and Colorado, to the nuclear weapons testing grounds in Nevada, the atom brought a rapid and dra drastic change to the West. Billions of dollars washed over the region like a drought-ending thunderstorm, and tens of thousands of people immigrated to the West to support the research, development, assembly, and storage of nuclear weapons. My family was one of them. The person that chose the location of Los Alamos, the one who had first placed a nu nuclear facility in the West, was, of course, J. Robert Oppenheimer. Without his original decision, the history of the region, both in terms of the generously funded federal operations in the West, as well as the West of popular imagination, would be vastly distant, different. Let's now turn to Oppenheimer's security woes, which culminated in the Gray Board, also known as the Personal Security Board. After the success of the atom bomb in ending World War II, and during the early post-war period, Oppenheimer advised presidents, senators, generals, admirals, statesmen. He influenced the first drafts of the nuclear energy policy, both nationally and internationally. He graced the covers of Time magazine, and he gained the trust of people worldwide as a wise man. His public lectures overflowed, were broadcast on radio and eventually on TV, and sometimes were quickly put into print, which became bestsellers. People were anxious about the atomic age, and Oppenheimer seemed to at least have some answers, and people flocked to him to hear him talk about what he thought the atomic age would bring. But in 1954, this all changed. His top security clearance was revoked, his security hearing became front page news, his patriotism was questioned, and some even accused him of being a spy for the Soviet Union. His fall from grace came about for many reasons, but summed up, he had made some enemies of some very powerful people in the federal government and in the military. Some of these people distrust Oppenheimer because they thought he was a spy, some because of their own personal pettiness, and others because they wanted to remove his powerful and influential voice from the debate on atomic matters. Early on, Oppenheimer was one of the main authors of the atchison lilienthal report, a plan which was presented to the UN in somewhat altered form as the Baruch Plan. The report proposed that the Atomic Development Authority, the ADA, would become an international agency, and this would take over all of the enterprises connected with the splitting of the atom, and, uh, and, the, and the use of the potential beneficial uh, the potential benefits of atomic energy um, would be rewarded to countries um, that abided by the rules of the authority. This is a picture of Bernard Baruch talking about atomic energy at the, at the United Nations. I kind of uh, muffed over that sentence, but 
basically the, the ADA, the Atomic Development Authority, would take over internationally all enterprises connected with the splitting of the atom. And then they would reward countries that abided by this regulation uh, with, um, uh, uh, with atomic energy. Um, as recommended by the report, the ADA would monopolize and own all worldwide facilities involved with the mining, research, and production of both the civilian and military applications of nuclear energy. From uranium mines to research laboratories to future power production plants around the world, the ADA would control it all. Additionally, any building of atomic weapons would be outlawed. To accomplish this, the ADA would control all nuclear material to prevent it from becoming weapons. This plan was never adopted by the UN. However, this call for a one-world plan for the control of nuclear material and nuclear weapons upset some people in the United States government. At the time, we still had an atomic monopoly, and relinquishing the atomic bombs and nuclear energy to the international organization did not strike some as protecting the country's security. By the early 1950s, Oppenheimer began to question the path that the country had taken about nuclear weapons. He questioned the secrecy, he questioned the H-bomb, and he questioned the arms race. In an article in Foreign Affairs in 1953, Oppenheimer lamented, quote, I must tell about the arms race without revealing anything. I must reveal its nature without revealing anything, end quote. He also warned that the country, that the nation's uh, economy was destined to be skewered by an arms race and that security would be used to cover up instances of malfeasance, payoffs, and blunders. In another article, Oppenheimer questioned the sanity of the arms race comparing the United States and the USSR, quote, to two scorpions in a bottle, each capable of killing the other, but only at the risk of his own life. This was not what Louis Strauss, who was head of the AEC at the time, and Dr. Edward Teller and others involved with nuclear weapons wanted broadcast to the American public. For these people, something had to be done before this influential voice, and hero to many Americans, started tilting the public away from their support of the nuclear arms race. Let me be specific about those people who arrayed against Oppenheimer in the early 1950s. The first is J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI. In the 1930s, Oppenheimer had turned to left-wing politics, as many people did during the Great Depression, as, uh, as a way that the Great Depression might be solved at home. And also, um, the communists were those who were fighting the fascists in Europe in the 1930s. Setting, uh, seeing the communists fight the fascists in the Spanish Civil War and listening to their promises of a new economic system that would abolish the suffering of the Great Depression, people across the United States supported the Communist Party. Oppenheimer was one of them and was joined by girlfriends and eventually by his wife, Kitty. <coughs> Kitty had, uh, had been married previously to a Communist Party member who had been killed on the battlefield in the Spanish Civil War fighting in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. That was Joe Dowd. Oppenheimer's brother Frank and his wife were also Communist Party members. Um, we've never been able to, uh, it's never been established that Oppenheimer officially joined the Communist Party himself. In 1937, Hokan Chavalier, a professor of French literature at Berkeley, met Oppenheimer at a benefit for the Loyalists in the Spanish Civil War. As a new professor at Berkeley, Hokan attended CP meetings in the Bay Area and raised money for the Spanish Loyalists, raised money for California farm workers and other left-wing causes. During this period of intensifying emotions about the growing war in Europe, Oppie and Hokan became holding meetings with other professors and labor organizers to discuss politics in the Bay Area. Later, the two men had very different memories of what happened at those meetings. Oppie claimed that the group consisted of naive people who innocently and informally met at each other's houses to discuss current events and politics. Hokan disagreed and called the group a, quote, quote, closed unit, unquote, um, a clandestine cell of this Communist Party for professionals who wanted to keep their party membership secret. Hokan made this claim years later, after he had found out that Oppenheimer inf informed on him to Army intelligence during the war. Oppenheimer in 1943 had told Army intelligence that Chevalier had approached him soon after he had been appointed director of the Los Alamos Laboratory and asked if Oppenheimer wanted to pass on any information about their work on atomic weapons to the Soviets. Oppenheimer, of course, denied, denied uh, uh, making the exchange of information. 
He said that he wouldn't mind that information going to the Soviets, the Soviets were allies at the time, but he would want it to go through official channels. So it was out of his hands, in, that, in, in other words. Oppenheimer's attendance at left-wing meetings attracted the interest of the Federal Bureau of, Inf uh, of Investigation. Oppie first came to the FBI's attention in the fall of 1940, when he attended a meeting at Hokan's house. Others at that meeting included William Schneiderman, secretary of the 13th District of the CP of California, and Isaac Falkoff, a financial supporter of the party in the Bay Area. Because he attended the meeting, the FBI began watching Oppenheimer, and in March of 1941, put him on a national list for, quote, custodial detention in the event of a national emergency, end quote. So as early as the spring of 1941, at about the same time that Oppenheimer began his work that would lead to the atomic bomb, the FBI put him on a list of people to pick up and imprison in case of a national emergency. During the war, Groves told the FBI to not worry about Oppenheimer, that Army intelligence would keep an eye on him. Once the war was over, though, the FBI could watch Oppenheimer and Kitty, and they did. The previous one was Oppenheimer's photo for his security badge here, and this is Kitty's photo for his security badge here in Los Alamos. Um, the FBI bugged his house, listened to his phone calls, and at times followed him around. Um, there are three rolls of microfilm of their reports on Oppenheimer um, that I've been able to go through, uh, and it's called In the Matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Now, I don't know what you think about this type of surveillance, but for a historian, it is great. <laughs> I was able to read transcribed conversations between Oppenheimer and Kitty, uh, amongst their friends and other people. Um, so I just would like to say thank you, FBI. Right now. <laughs> A second group of influential people in the federal government who were against Oppenheimer was the Air Force, and in particular, the Strategic Air Command. Oppenheimer argued against this, against SAC, against the Strategic Air Command. He thought that defense, defense dollars would be better spent on other ways to deliver nuclear weapons, not with long-range bombers. Oppenheimer also argued against the development of the hydrogen bomb in 1949, when Truman debated whether to pursue that in response to Joe One, the Soviet bomb that was detonated in uh, uh, September, October of 1949. Oppenheimer said the atomic bomb was powerful enough to get the job done. This angered some powerful people in the government and the military, and resulted in some of them questioning his, royal, his loyalty. Louis Strauss was also against Oppenheimer. Now, President Eisenhower appointed Strauss as head of the AEC as soon as he came into office in 1953. Strauss accepted it, but with a caveat, which was that if he came in, he would get rid of Oppenheimer's uh, influence in the AEC. Strauss had developed a personal dislike for Oppenheimer. Um, and this might have come at a congressional hearing when um, Strauss was arguing against um, exporting radioactive isotopes to some other countries in the world for research and medical um, issues, saying that if these, these isotopes could be turned into atomic weapons. And Oppenheimer came to the table and was asked if that was true. And he said, well, yes, that's true. But also, a shovel can be helpful in making an atomic bomb. Um, and even a beer bottle can be helpful in making an atomic bomb, and oftentimes is, kind of making a joke of it. Everybody laughed, but those who were watching Strauss saw his face go beet red. And it's possible there that his personal animosity against Oppenheimer uh, began. Strauss used his, or his uh, position to organize a campaign to remove Oppenheimer, not just from his top secret work, but from his position as a spokesman for an alternative path, path in nuclear weapons policy. Strauss put together a group of people, former Army intelligence officers, White House press officers, military officers, lawyers, and Dr. Teller to accuse Oppenheimer of being a security risk. Now we don't have time to go into the uh, grueling Gray Board, named after the chairman, Gordon Gray. There's, there's Teller, of course and Gordon Gray, who was a former Secretary of the Army and President at the time of the uh, University of North Carolina. The Gray Board is also known as the Personal Security Board, and these proceedings lasted about a month in the spring of 1954. If you're interested, there's a 997-page transcript of all of the proceedings. <laughs> um, 
Let me hit some of the higher, what some consider the low points. Oppenheimer was accused at first of being a spy. And that was going back to his relationship with Chevalier, the fact that his wife had been a CP member, his brother and sister-in-law had also been CP members. But the two main charges against Oppenheimer in the Personal Security Board was that he was a secret agent of the Communist Party and that he also helped in delaying the development of the hydrogen bomb. Um, Oppenheimer's lawyer, Lloyd Garrison, could not gain top secret sec uh, security clearance. So at times he had to leave the hearing room um, when top secret material was discussed. So in essence, Oppenheimer was then left without any legal counsel. Privileged telephone conversations between Oppenheimer and his lawyers were taped by the FBI. And at one point, an FBI agent who was listening to these tapes called up the, um, the, the headquarters in Washington, D.C. and said, we're listening to privileged conversation between Oppenheimer and his lawyer. Should I continue? And word came back from Washington that they considered Oppenheimer a flight risk. And they were listening to this information so that if, in, if he did intend to, um, to uh, escape to the Soviet Union, that the FBI would be there in time to intercept him. After the first day of hearings, where Oppenheimer's team pledged to keep the proceedings secret, Straws, along with James Haggerty, who was the White House press secretary at the time, leaked the story to the New York Times. Thinking that the Oppenheimer team had broken their promise about confidentiality, the members of the Great Board did not trust Oppenheimer nor his lawyers uh, from then on, and that also helped undermine his credibility. Ultimately, the board voted two to one to revoke Oppenheimer's security clearance. And on June 29, 1954, the AEC commissioners split their vote four to one to revoke the clearance. This is the front page of the New Mexico on June 30th, 1954. Now what's ironic about this is that Oppenheimer's contract with the AEC would have expired and his access to top secret files would have ended, ended anyway on June 30th, 1954. Dr. Emil Sidre, a Nobel Prize winning nuclear physicist who worked with Oppenheimer in Los Alamos, was asked why the hearings occurred. And he answered, quote, they took place because there was a political situation in which a side of this political struggle wanted to damage as much as possible the others. Who were the parties in this political struggle is a complex thing. But I would say that the Air Force, part of the Atomic Energy Commission, part of the Armed Services, one part having won, wanted to consolidate their victory by destroying an important chief of the opposite party. Oppenheimer was there in the middle, pretty innocently, I feel, end quote. So what did the revocation do? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the revocation did remove this powerful voice, which had begun publicly doubting the government's nuclear weapons policy. There was outrage across the country when this hit the, hit the newspapers, and outrage that Oppenheimer might be a spy. Um, in some of the uh, letters at the Library of Congress, uh, the Oppenheimer papers there, um, he kept the hate mail that he received after, after the security revocation. So he became a, uh, a reviled person as well as his wife Kitty did. And so that effectively, this kind of publicly, uh, public humiliation, removed this powerful voice. It also warned others. Several scientists talked to the New Mexican on the condition that they remain anonymous right after the, uh, uh, the decision became public. According to one, Quote, the general effect of the Oppenheimer hearing in Los Alamos was a crystallization of the attitude, there but for the grace of God go I, end quote. As this person later on said, some of us were also against the h bar, and now do we have to worry about our positions. In addition to the almost 300 scientists who protested the great board's vote for revocation, approximately 200 more lab personnel, including five of the seven division heads at the laboratory, signed a, dis, uh, a petition disagreeing with the board's decision. And some considered that this was a show trial. And this is also came at the very end of, of the McCarthy uh, hearings as well. Um, what happened to Abi? Well, he returned to the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, and some said that he became a better director afterwards, since he was able to focus on the Institute more. While he was there, he brought scientists, artists, mathematicians, uh, humanists, intellectuals, 
even historians, took Princeton for research and fellowship. But it also shattered him personally. Um, Henry Smythe, the lone dissenter on the Atomic Energy Commission uh, for revoking his clearance, was later asked if the hearing had affected Abi. He replied, quote, oh yes, it killed him, end quote. Shotzi Davis, who had lived near the Oppenheimers here in Los, Los Alamos, visited them in Princeton that fall. And this is a little bit later than that. This, uh, this is, I think, where they're here in Los Alamos in 1964. Um, but anyway, Shotzi Davis visited them in Princeton that fall, and she expected to find the usual lively Oppenheimer household, but instead she saw Oppie and Kitty looking sad and tired. In 1960, Oppenheimer and Kitty visited Japan. During a private audience with a group of Japanese scientists and professors, Oppenheimer noted that the day before President Roosevelt died, FDR, FDR had worked on a speech about atomic weapons. Oppenheimer continued, quote, In the speech, Roosevelt spoke of the mastery of man over the forces of nature. And then he said, What we need if we are to survive is a science of human relations. Oppenheimer continued, I have always been bothered by that speech. Because if we have to wait for the science of human relations, we might very well not be here, end quote. At one point, Japanese journalists quizzed Oppie about the atomic bombing of their country, a somewhat delicate topic. Oppie replied, quote, I do not regret that I had something to do with the technical success of the atomic bomb. It isn't that I don't feel bad. It is that I don't feel worse tonight than I did last night. Oppenheimer did visit Los Alamos in 1964 and was rehabilitated. And actually, in the 60s, he was rehabilitated several ways. Um, he also received the Fermi Award uh, presented uh, by President Johnson uh, right after President Kennedy was assassinated, I think in December of 1963. During that ceremony, uh, I forget who it was, but somebody came up to Oppie and said, do you want to go through another security hearing to, to uh, gain your good name back? And Oppenheimer said, not on your life. Oppenheimer died on February 18, 1967, from cancer probably caused by his chain smoking over the decades. J. Robert Oppenheimer helped change the world. He assisted in releasing the binding energy of the atom, which ended the most horrific war in human history. He helped, he helped transform the western part of the United States from a not marginalized part of the country to one which is a pace setter in technology and science. He also sought to change the direction of the Cold War with our country's policies toward nuclear weapons. Now, perhaps this is a stretch, but bear with me here. On January 17, 2007, just a little over a year, a couple years ago, in a Wall Street Journal article, former Secretaries of State George Shultz and Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of the Defense William Perry, and former Senator Sam Nunn wrote an article called The World Free of Nuclear Weapons. They asked, quote, can a worldwide consensus be forged that defines a series of practical steps leading to major reductions in the nuclear danger? They made two recommendations. And suspiciously, they sound like part of the Atchison Lilienthal uh, plan. The first was getting control of the uranium enrichment, enrichment process, combined with the guarantee that uranium for nuclear, nuclear power reactors could be attained at a reasonable price. First from a nuclear suppliers group, and then from the International Atomic Energy Agency, or other controlled international reserves. It will also be necessary to deal with proliferation issues presented by spent fuel from reactors producing electricity, they wrote in their article. In another part of the article, they wrote, quote, halting the production of fissile material for weapons globally, phasing out the use of highly enriched uranium in civil commerce, uh, commerce and removing weapons usable uranium from research facilities around the world and rendering, rendering the materials safe, end quote. It would be ironic as well as fitting to Oppie's genius that his vision for a nuclear-free world laid out in the Atchison Lilienthal plan is one that eventually comes to pass through this, this, uh, this proposal. Thank you very much for coming tonight, and uh, I'm, I'm open for questions. Jay probably doesn't stand for anything. Um, as, as much as I can um, 
and I can, uh, in my research found out, is that Oppenheimer's father gave him a J before the robber to give him a more distinguished name. Is that, Ellen, is that, yeah, was it? Uh, the, the FBI thought it stood for Julius. So in a lot of the FBI, uh, uh, a lot of the FBI uh, literature about him, they talked about Julius Robert Oppenheimer. But um, other stories say that his father just gave that to him because it, it made him sound more distinguished. Any other questions, sir? Uh, could a president reinstate Oppenheimer's term? President, oh, sure. John, I know there's a lawyer in Santa Fe who's working hard to get, uh, I don't know, to get his clearance back, but to clear his name. Pardon me? Um, yeah, so, so there are some people who still are interested in this question and trying to, uh, to restore his good name. Um, I do have to nervously say, though, that I have a colleague at the history department in, in, uh, in Las Cruces, in New Mexico State University, who is a historian of Russia. And he has told me that Oppenheimer's file with the former KGB has not been opened yet. So that makes me pretty nervous. Probably it'll be open the day my book comes out. <laughs> um, let me mention something. Um, when Hetty and I were planning for this talk months and months ago, I thought my book, Chasing Oppie, would, would be out in print by now, and we would, we would have a book signing. But uh, university presses work in mysterious ways, and uh, for some reason I got in the back of their production queue, and so the book is now going to come out in the fall. And, uh, and I will be more than happy to come back and have a book signing with Los Alamos Historical Society then. Um, also, talking about how mysteriously university presses work, um, for years, I've, I've been working on this book since I finished my last book, so since about 2003, so about six years, and I've always wanted to call it Chasing Abbey. Um, Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer, um, The Cold War and the Atomic West, something like that. And of course, I sent in my, my manuscript uh, that I worked tirelessly for years on, um, Chasing Oppie, and, the, and they said, we don't, you can't use Chasing Oppie. Um, it just, people won't know who Oppie is, and it sounds like you're doing something else with this. So, I, so they, they um, prevented me from using the name that I, I would really like on that book. But nonetheless, the, the title's not my own, but the rest of the book is. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, the question is that um, this gentleman has said that um, he f it seems that, that Oppenheimer was singled out, um, but that he probably had a circle of friends that, that were around him too. Um, Oppenheimer was kind of singled out, but, um, but also the Rosenbergs were, were singled out too. Um, so, it, and that was a, a little bit before this, uh, the, the Grey Borg, but kind of of the same tenor of the times. Um, Hokan Chevalier um, applied for war work during the war, but because of the revelation that Oppenheimer said that he had been approached by Chevalier to pass secrets on, he never got the work that he wanted to. Um, Chevalier did, uh, was a, a translator at the Nuremberg War Trials, but when he came back, um, he, he found that he couldn't get work and he eventually immigrated to France. Uh, uh, Oppenheimer's brother, Frank, also, um, because he was also part of that kind of revelation of, of maybe um, being approached to release secrets during the Manhattan Project. Um, and, uh, when, and Frank was, uh, was working at, I think, the University of Minnesota. When that revelation came out, he lost his faculty appointment there and really couldn't, I mean, he wasn't as brilliant, perhaps, a physicist as, as his brother was, but. Uh, but he still he could he was a good teacher of physics and so he was wasn't able to teach in the physics department. But then Frank did go on to create the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Other questions? Yes, sir. Was Dr. Oppenheimer's IQ ever measured? <laughs> I, I'm sure it was, but I, I think it broke the machine. 
<laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what his IQ. The question was, was his IQ ever measured? I, I don't. I don't know what that. What that was. Yes, ma'am. What was the date of the Time Magazine um, picture cover? Was he man of the year? Or? Um, he was not man of the year, and and I have that. I, I don't have it on top of my head, but I have it in my computer. I can look at it and, and it was, give it to you. It was. It was before the hearings. It was before the hearings. After he served here. Yeah, it was. It was in the early post-war period, and and I can get that that date to you. I'm sorry, I don't have it. The question was, uh, excuse me. The question was, what was the date of the uh, of the uh, uh, the Time magazine where Oppenheimer was on the cover? And actually, I think he was on the cover twice. I'll, I'll double check that. I only had one photograph that I found. Other questions? Yes, sir. Did uh, Groves intervene at all during the hearings process to try to defend Oppenheimer or play any role? Um, he was torn. He was definitely torn. Um, he had um, he knew of, of all of these security questions that the FBI had before he appointed him director of, of the laboratory during the Manhattan Project. And still, and this is you know those of you who, who know the history of the Manhattan Project is probably one of the most curious choices why Avi would became was selected as the director. But um, Groves felt that he was a good judge of character, and. Uh, and so he, uh, he picked Oppenheimer fairly quickly. There wasn't a long vetting process, but he did know about the security concerns. And actually, Oppenheimer was appointed director of the laboratory, I think November of 1942, something like that. And he didn't get a security clearance until June of 43, because the Army intelligence had problems with, um, with his past as well. And it wasn't until Groves went to them and said, you give him a clearance, by gosh, maybe a little bit stronger than that. And, um, and, and, and so they were forced to give him a clearance. But the Army Intelligence wasn't too thrilled about that. Yeah, Helen. I have just a little excerpt, but when uh, they were talking to Groves about was Oppenheimer the right choice, Groves said, well, they said, is, you know, is he strong enough leader? He said, well, he's ambitious, and whatever he lacks in ambition, his wife makes up. <laughs> Other questions? Anybody up there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I just have a comment. I've been in New Mexico since 1932, but I didn't come to Los Alamos until very much later, and um, 1950, late. But I appreciate your coming and bringing us up to speed again on this part of our local history. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's been my pleasure. It really has. Yes. What do you know about Avi's hat? <laughs> there, it's darn hard to find one. I've been I've been looking for one because you know I'm an Avi guy. I want to wear a pork pie hat, and I go. I've, I've been into hat stores in New York City, in Albuquerque, in Santa Fe. You can't find his hat. It's called a pork pie hat. It, it, you know, pork, the pork pie hats that I that people try to sell me are not like that. Um, in, in 2004, we had a symposium here that some of you might might have attended on the centennial of Afi's birth in, in, in uh, uh, 1904. And there was a guy by the name Andy, was Andy Oppenheimer, who claims to be a distant relative of Robert Oppenheimer. And he had, he had a, a hat, just a dead ringer for Afi's hat. Um, he also had blue contact lenses and then... I saw him, I first saw him in front of the Bradbury Science Museum, and it was literally, <laughs> it, it's a ghost of Avi here, he looks just like him. And I asked him where he got the hat, and he said, well, he had to order it from Australia, it was some type of bush hat from Australia. So it, it's a, it's, it, he's an enigmatic person, uh, very complex, and uh, his name is one of them. Um, people don't know how to, how to spell his nickname, it's spelled three different ways. And he left it like that. He never corrected people. But I think his hat was also part of this kind of enigmatic personality. But it became a symbol of him. Uh, on the first cover of Physics Today, all it is is kind of some tubes and faucets and valves coming out, and his hat hung on it. And everybody knew what that meant. Yes, sir. Uh, at least two KGB agents have said that one should be cautious about believing anything in the KGB files because they said that, that agents would make up things to boost their performance appraisal, and so there's a lot of misinformation in the uh, KGB files. 
I, the, 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 uh, the comment is that there's a lot of misinformation in the KGB files, and, uh, and that's probably true. And there's also that book by Sudo Platov. What's the title of that book? Secret something. But, so that, and he's a former KGB general who makes in his book the claim that uh, Oppenheimer was a Soviet agent um, and says that uh, there was a deep cell that's, uh, in, Santa Fe, in Santa Fe in a pharmacy on the plaza. Um, and I know Ellen's researched that. Yeah. Well, that actually was a drugstore, probably the capital drugstore, that was run by two Russian. Mexico often, and what Sudoplato says is they ran the Trotsky assassination, and then when Los Alamos was put here, they just went, oh good, we already have that in place. But, um, so, take that with a grain of salt. Okay. Um, but the drugstore was there run by two Russians. Yeah, there was a drugstore. Secret Tasks, is that the name of it? Yeah. Sorry. It, I, I don't put a whole lot of credence in it. So. Other questions? Uh, this has been my great pleasure and honor to address you. Thank you very much.